Boom. Who do we have in the actual meeting? In the live meeting room. Can we just get a list of calls of who's in the uh, in the live part of the meeting? K one SLT. No, I know. I know the guys on Zoom. I could see your call signs. I, it's the guys in the room there. Who who do you have in there? Uh, here we go. I, my mic was off. I'm going to try to do this by memory, so uh, we'll see how good I do. We have uh, W1 STJ. We have W1 SNH. We have N1 JUR. We have Gene WA W3 UA. Thank you. Uh, uh, KC1 QDK AA1 TX W1 EAA AC1 J. N1 IMW, K1 XF, Barry and Mary, <laughs> NF10, and uh, and and Mary's call. N1F. We have uh, KB1 QVO. I know. Uh, yeah, I, I forget Kathy's call. K1 KKG, a call I don't hear too often. Uh, NA1T. One of Mitch's students, KC1, what was it? M. KC1 SVS. KC1 SVS, and what? Oh, I'm sorry, what was KC1 KMM. And, uh, and myself, W1 WRA. So I guess that completes roll call. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, it's always good to know who, who's there. I, I used to, one of my loves in ham radio, besides contesting and operating, is, is teaching classes. And I taught classes in Manchester for like 25 years. I said, well, how come you didn't do it in Vermont? I said, because in Vermont, we got more cows than people, and the cows don't really learn ham radio too well. So I go down to Manchester. And in uh, 2019, things were getting kind of slow. Um, you know, the local paper, um, what are they called, the Union Disbeliever or something like that, they, they said, well, you got to take an ad out. Because they used to have a guy in there that would publicize the ham radio events, whatever. I says, you know, all us hams, our old guys, we're the ones reading the paper. The kids don't do that. So that kind of stopped. And all my VEs were getting old and kind of hard to find. And the last session I did in November 2019, when I went to my favorite Friday night dinner at Boston Market, uh, it was closed. It was gone. I said, that's it. It's a sign from God. I'm not doing this anymore. And I went to online classes. And then COVID hit three months later. So that was... Uh, that worked really well, actually. So um, at any rate, um, as, as way, way, way of background, uh, I've been licensed 54 years, something like that. Uh, I got licensed when I was a wee young guy. And uh, you know, my first love is contesting and DXing. I, I also do uh, public service events. I do teaching. I do ham fests. Uh, do a lot of stuff. And... Um, so for tonight's talk, I'm going to talk about being the best operator. And I tend to be very controversial. I'm going to, I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to tell you what I think. You may not agree with me. You say, well, I heard this different. You know, what are you talking about? And you, you know, certainly have a right to disagree. I mean, that's what it's about. But um, I make about an average of about 7,000 CUSOs a year to various contests and stuff I do. This year, it's probably going to be more like 10,000 because um, we, we – uh, I and a bunch of the guys are doing W1EW Portable 1. We did that a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, this past weekend, we did the New England CUSO party and a park activation at the same time. So we activated a park and did the CUSO party, uh, 1,500 contacts or something like that. We, we do a lot of this stuff. Um, so I, I, I hear a lot of stuff. And so, you know, by doing that, I kind of get a sense of, of what's going on and you know, what's happening and whatever. And I hope to kind of share some of that because some of the people who operate kind of are not very good at it and, and they, they could be certainly. So I'm going to do this in two parts. And, and by the way, if I run over, start yelling at me or throwing things because I keep adding to this and it keeps going longer and longer. <laughs> so um, keep, me, uh, keep me on track here. Um, so the first part I'm going to talk about is emergency preparedness, emergency communications, because that's important. It's important because 
Well, you know, that, that's the prime directive. The prime directive is recognition and enhancement of the value of the amateur service to the public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. That, that's right out of the mouth of the FCC. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And, you know, we might as well be doing something useful and, and helping out feels good. Uh, now, you know, there's not a, as much need for us because people have cell phones and whatever, but by God, when something happens, we better be ready, willing, and able to, to do it. So uh, the first thing I'm going to uh, bring up here, um, and I'm going to share the screen, and hopefully this works. Do that, we do that. And there we go. So you guys can see that, right? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Are you ready for an emergency? Uh, so I'm going to ask some questions. Let, let's see if you guys are. So the first thing is, do you have a charged HT with you at all times? Okay, so I can't see the hands in the room. How many people have an HT, charge HT with them, ready to go? I see one hand, maybe two. <laughs> yeah, I think I see two two hands here, and I can't easily see the online yeah. hands. But yeah, so you know, by the way, emergencies don't happen by schedule; they they just happen, and you, you got to be ready. And by the way, the HT is no good unless you charge it. If if you let it like sit around, it uh, the battery dies. Now, I mean, I have my HT here ready. It it is in my computer bag at all times. It's always with me. Uh, okay. Um, I have it. Uh, most of the time I listen to the ball games on it, but you know, I, I could also get on the local repeaters. Can you program your HT without a computer? Um, many people can't. And, and I run uh, the Vermont City Marathon. I tell them, I says, um, yeah, these are the frequencies we're going to use and put them in memory, but you got to be able to change your frequency. If we have to change something, the repeater blows up and the backup blows up and we have to do something different, you have to be able to put a frequency and offset a tone and all that stuff in there. If you can't do that, th then you're not helpful to us. You really need to know how to do that. And I get a lot of pushback from, from my wife, W1DEB, is that, what do I have to do this for? This is stupid. I said, it's not stupid because we, we run into that problem. You have a working mobile radio in your vehicle. Okay, I know a lot of hams, they have the call letter plates and no radio whatsoever in the car. What a waste of a good car. You're supposed to have a mobile radio. You're supposed to talk to people while driving. That's the whole point of this. When I go out to Dayton, I'm going to be on the radio the, the entire time. I actually operate FT8 in the car. And my wife goes, what are you going to do that for? It's stupid. What's the point of it? You're not talking to anyone. I said, that's exactly the point. I don't have to talk to these people. I just make the contact, get the QSL cards, and move on, right? Uh, I don't have to listen to the static or anything. Do you have multiple sources of backup power? Well, you know, the, the battery in this HD is only going to last a day or so, right? And, and then if there is no power, if it's a real emergency, there's no place to plug in, where are you going to plug it into? Well, I'll plug it into the car. Uh, yeah, okay, if it's a long-term power outage, and, and you know, our electrical grid ain't doing all that good these days, right? We hear that. If it's long-term power outage, um, car's going to run out of gas. Well, I'll fill it up at the gas station. Yeah, but you need power to fill up the car with gas. So, you know, do you have a hand crank generator or solar cell, whatever? I mean, these are the things you need to think about. Do you keep your gas tank full? So when I was younger, I didn't. I used to see how far can I make that needle go to empty and have the car still run. And a couple of times I'd run out of gas and I had to get on the auto patch. This is before we had cell phones. Get on the auto patch call, though I bring the gas can. I ran out of gas again. And I realized this is kind of stupid. So now I keep the gas tank full. Okay, do you have basic food, and water and food rations available? Um, so, I mean... I keep about eight gallons of water in the basement because, you know, I mean, you can go several days without food, but not without water. And, of course, you could take this to the level of being a prepper and have meals ready to eat and lots of water and, you know, the whole thing hunkered down in the basement. But at the very least, um, you know, if the water supply stops or whatever, uh, or you, you don't have any food, or the supermarkets are closed, you should at least have a, a few days backup. I mean, that, that's just basic smart. Um, do you have any idea what to do? Here's the emergency. What do I do? I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't even know where the repeaters are. Well, that's that's a bad idea. At the very least, um, you know, clubs should take the lead. Hey, if we have an emergency, this is what we're going to do. Here's the plan. There's supposedly an emergency coordinator appointed by your section manager that's supposed to do that. Do they do that? Don't know. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. And so this comes down to emergencies are not planned, they just happen, and usually they happen at very inopportune times. In my case, they happen first thing Sunday morning when I'm asleep, and, and I don't really like that. So th these are things you need to think about if you're going to be ready for that emergency. Uh, so, I mean, typical large-scale emergency scenarios in New England, it's flooding, snow, and winds. Uh, the, you know, we, we don't get too much in the way of earthquakes here or anything like that or uh, forest fires. We can have them, but it's usually flooding. And snow isn't really an emergency. I mean, the way you deal with snow is stay home. So how do you deal with all that snow in northern Vermont? I says it's very simple. When it snows, I sit in the house and watch it snow. I don't go anywhere. <laughs> so that's, that's how you deal with it. You know, people got to go driving, whatever. The wet, And, of course, snow is a lot less now. The weather's clearly changing. It's getting warmer and all that stuff. Um, we can get into a whole discussion. Who's causing it? That's not the point. It is things are changing. And there is more effect on people as they live in more hazardous places like mountain passes, floodplains. That's a big one. You know, our emergency management, our state emergency management is in a floodplain in a place called Waterbury. Why do you think they call it Waterbury? Because it floods there, and that's where they have it. And during uh, Hurricane Irene, uh, instead of managing the emergency management of the state, they were loading the rowboats and evacuating the building. Okay, people on barrier islands, deserts, all that stuff. Uh, other other emergencies, civil unrest, uh, less availability in food and fuel will trigger this. Now, so, you know, you go to the supermarket, you see empty shelves. How empty do those shelves have to get before people start shooting at one another? I always ask that question because there's less inclination of people to behave responsibly. And uh, and we don't want to think about it, but terrorism is certainly happens. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that just gets downright scary. And, yes, I was in Boston when the bomb went out, so I, I went off, so I know what this is about. So is ham radio really needed? Uh, the answer is mm, usually no. Most emergencies can be handled by the civil authorities, can be handled by the local police and fire with all that. Ham radio is not necessarily needed or desired. Uh, and ham radio behavior sometimes turns off the authorities. So hams show up, they got their bright orange uh, vests on and everything and their Aries sticker on their cars. And, okay, we're here, we're going to take over. And, like, cops say, uh, no, we, we don't need you here. Get out, go home. And then go home. Go home. They, they don't need you. That's, that's really what it is. But sometimes we are needed. Uh, local emergencies sometimes can overtax, overtax the local authorities. You know, we have, um, like, like New Hampshire, Vermont, we have small police forces, and a big thing will overtax them, and they can't handle larger disasters. Also, wide area emergencies like weather issues and situations where their normal communications are disrupted. So what you need to do is develop relationship with the government and the police department uh, to develop knowledge and trust. Sometimes it works well. We, we get along really well with our local police here. Not so well in our big city in Burlington. They think we're a bunch of amateurs. Well, we are. And, you know, they're professionals and whatever. So be it. You know, one day they'll need it. They'll need us. They have my phone number. So our job is to talk on the radio, nothing else. If you want to do other stuff, don't do amateur radio. I mean, when I run a marathon and I call you, I need an answer now. Not like, hey, I'm busy talking to somebody or I'm busy directing traffic. Let somebody else do that. If you have an, another job and a job on the radio, pick one. You can't serve two masters. And your job is actually the job in all of ham radio is to pass information quickly and accurately. That's the gig. So you plan for anything. Avoid playback scenarios, uh, uh, playbook scenarios. We, we hear all the time, oh, yeah, we got this playbook, do this, do that, whatever. Well, you know, before 2001, nobody expected anyone to fly into a building, right? Uh, so the next big disaster will be something we haven't even imagined. And so you really need to be able to do anything, any way, anyhow possible. 
miracle work is in play. And, and I, I tell people, it says, listen, if you need it communicated, I will figure out how to do it. That, that's all it needs to do. You, you can trust me. I will get it done because that's what we do. So, I mean, the emergency scenario for operators, you know, you have the station and operator care. I'm going to jump over this and talk about the station. Um, and we, I use the term RAP, radio antenna power. So when we got all these things working well, we call it RAP music, right? So make sure your radio is reliable. You know, if you have a radio that kind of cuts out, that's probably not a radio you should be using. Assure you can set any frequency, offset, or tone. They actually know how to use the thing. And have both an HT for portability and a mobile for high power. And headphones are a must. There was a guy who did a uh, park activation over at um, the park over there in by Hanover there, South, uh, Corin, uh, Cornish, right? I forget the name of it. Saint Laurent, I think it is. And uh, he set up his wire and his QRP radio, and he was all happy and whatever. And he gets on, and he doesn't have headphones, and a whole troop of Girl Scouts show up to have lunch, and they're chattering away, and he can't hear a darn thing. And so, finally, they go away. Okay, I'm going to operate now. And he gets out the radio, turns it on, and then the lawnmowers come out. But the funny part of that whole thing was he actually filmed this. He videoed it and uploaded it to YouTube. By God, if that was me, that would not be uploaded. That video would be erased. <laughs> so, I use that as an example. And we had one case where a guy forgot the headphones, and it was a real bear. Have a backup antenna ready to be deployed. Don't rely, don't rely on the rubber duck. You know, I have a little two-meter dipole that I can hang from anything uh, if I need to. Um, have a mobile antenna ready to go. And repeaters may not be working. You, you may need to do this simplex. AC power is great if it's available. I mean, that, that's always super. Uh, so you should have, for a mobile radio, have a charge 17 to 24 amp hour battery, uh, either a, a big gel cell to get out of UPS or a motorcycle battery uh, to power the mobiles. And again, don't rely on the HD battery. Uh, that's only good for 24 hours. And by the way, the repeaters that are really smug and say, we have backup power on our repeater. Well, you know, you remember that power outage that started in Ohio and came across Ohio and across New York State? It was about, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, whatever. Uh, and we were spared in Vermont because some guy who was half asleep in Highgate where the power comes over from New York, he kicked out the plug. He saw it coming across. He kicked out the plug, and we were spared. And so I heard about all the repeaters in New York City, and uh, about six or seven of them stayed on because they had battery backup. Well, guess what happened after 24 hours? The batteries died. They were done. The only repeater that was on the air, I actually contacted him on, on Echolink, not Echolink, on IRLP. I said, how come you're on? Everyone's dark. He says, I have full generator and I'm using, um, um, I'm using the uh, telephone uh, link up. Uh, not, the telephone link up is backed up, right? So uh, he, he was live. So yeah, repeat, a lot, and the main Aries repeater in New York City didn't even have battery backup. So everyone was running around trying to do simplex, which didn't work so well. So have a plan to be on the air in a prolonged emergency. Operate from the vehicle, uh, have solar power, where will the fuel come from, all that stuff. There's no right answer, but you should be certainly thinking about it. So during emergencies, Murphy's Law is on steroids. You all know what Murphy's Law is, right? Whatever can go wrong will go wrong, and it, and, and it will. It's kind of like field day, right? Field day, everything goes wrong, goes wrong. And, uh, you know, we, we don't... We don't say if something blows out or something doesn't work. We say when, and we have three sets of backups. So I have a backup for everything, a backup radio, backup antenna, backup battery and power. But don't rely on the stupid computer. The computer is the first thing to go out, first thing to fail. Be able to do your job without the computer. Bring paper and pencil. Um, don't be off the air because the computer don't work. So in your ability, you need to practice, 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 practice. The best thing is making lots of QSOs, getting on there, getting on HF, getting on uh, contests. If you're a technician operator, the VHF QSO party is in a few weeks. Get on for that. Uh, go up to a, a drive up to a hill and get on 52 uh, direct. There'll be plenty of people to work. Uh, as you're passing information back and forth to each other, you're learning to pass information quickly and accurately. That's what it is. So activities like field day, which I heard you guys talking about, and park activations, which I heard you talking about, that, that's the gold standard. That's what you want to be doing. 
and get involved in reg and regularly in public service events. Now, I I'm going to say something that people will get upset. Checking into nets is not an effective practice. It, it's, it, it, as far as a training standpoint, it's kind of a waste of time. Well, I checked into a net, I'm trained. No, you're not. You checked into a net. Anyone could do that. And, you know, think about how a net starts. I, I always laugh about this. A guy comes on, gives us a long, drawn-out preamble for two minutes uh, about the net and all this stuff. And then he says, or she says, any stations with emergency or priority traffic go now. Well, wait a minute. If I have emergency traffic, if I have bodies laying in the street, you think I'm going to wait for that preamble and then give the tra No, stop the preamble. We got bodies laying in the street. Heck with this net business. We need to handle this now. And, and then uh, they have the thing they, when they want you to check in, you say, this is let up on the mic to see if you're doubling and then give your call sign. So what happens? Two people say this is at the exact same time. They let up at the mic at the same time and they double and you don't hear a darn thing. No, just let people give their call signs. Some will go through, some will, it'll be just like in a DX pileup. Some people will be copied, some people won't. The net control will say, this is who I heard. And if he doesn't list your call, try again. That's how it works. So what you need to do is learn to actively listen. What does actively listen? I talk to people in the car, right? And I'm talking to them for like five, 10 minutes. What's your name again? What's your call sign again? And like, if you do that to me, I kind of like go away. It's like, well, if I'm that unimportant that you have to keep asking my name and call sign, uh, I could be doing something else. So, I mean, that's what actively listening is. You know, talk to me like a person, you know, whatever. Learn to listen and get the message right. I, I mean, in a contest, it's important because you scored on it. And if it's a public service event, uh, you know, like in a marathon, you're passing runner numbers and stuff like that. You, you got to get that, that stuff right. You can't mess that up. And you learn to message with a minimum number of words. So in our marathon, we need to pass the runner number, the, the, the sex, which sometimes is hard these days, whatever, but that's what they ask us for. Um, the status, you know, are they breathing or whatever, and the exact location. Those four things, nothing else. And you get people, well, down North Avenue somewhere, somebody's laying on the ground, but we don't know who, no, don't do that. That's useless to us. Those four things, bang, 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 bang. You give me the message, I say, thank you. I pass that to the fire department. That's how it works quick and simple and if we have any questions we we'll say okay can you give me some information on this or whatever but those four things tells the fire department and the medical services what kind of equipment to roll down the course to get them so operator attitude you need to check your emotions at the door uh, no emotions mr. Spock man every emotion is illogical Maintain a level attitude no matter what. Ice water in the veins. Uh, emotional ops will scream into the microphone, oh my God, and not be understood. And uh, an emotion and panic will result in poor operating decisions. And this is a hard skill to, to master. You, you really need to separate yourself from what's happening. You're the reporter. You can't be part of the news story. So, so in the Boston Marathon, when, when, they, when they bombed it, I wasn't in my usual spot at the at the tent, uh, which was right across the street from where the bomb was. Uh, that particular year, they put me in the massage building, which, which is on the John Hancock building, about three blocks away in the basement. So I didn't hear a thing, uh, you know. And and I was mad because I should have been getting the massage. I was the oldest guy there, right? But do that as I'm on there, and then I hear a guy, "Oh my God, a bomb went over! Body parts flying around!" And he's yelling and screaming into the microphone, over deviating and. And right away, we all thought it was just some kind of character just screwing around with us, right? And then I wait two minutes and I don't hear any response or anything. And I go to, you know, net from SJ, um, um, what's going on? And then uh, the net comes, control comes back. Um, we don't know. I says, wrong answer. Again, what's going on? Well, there's been an apparent bomb. I said, okay, Net, can you describe to me the difference between an apparent bomb and a real bomb? And, and then finally, I, I, I plug something in the Net Control and they realize, okay, let's stop being stupid. Let's do what we need to do. And, and then they did, okay, let's do a roll call and see how many hams we have left <laughs> above ground, which was a smart thing to do. 
Um, I tell you, in my opinion, that was that was public service's worst day because uh, what did they do? They shut the phones off right away. It didn't affect me. I was in a building with wired phones, so I didn't care. I called called my wife. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's okay. Uh, they shut the phones off. They shut the trains off, and then they said, "Go home." Yeah, how do you do that exactly? <laughs> And and then they found a backpack and it was suspicious and so they detonated it. So now people are already jittery. They, they hear another bomb go off and people are now climbing the walls. And and the thing should be is stay in place and for the love of God, don't touch anything. <laughs> you know, and let, we'll figure this out. But they didn't do that. Everyone tried to do more than they should have and they could have made it really worse. So what do I do? When an emergency happens, what do I do? Well, first of all, turn on the radio if, if you can, if you have power. I mean, uh, you're not going to talk to anyone if you don't have a radio. Monitor local repeaters for activity. And again, this is something that should be worked out ahead of time. Monitor HF for activity if you have that kind of license. And quickly reach out to others via phone and email if that is possible. If there's no activity, start it. You know, I mean, uh, the first one who shows up is a net control. Have a master emergency plan, a plan for all hams to know what to do. What do we do? Oh, we have this problem. What do we do now? That That is really the thing. And you, you really need to kind of think about this stuff now instead of when the emergency happens. Um, the world's getting to be a very scary place, so uh, I, I would suggest that people really kind of focus in on this. All right, so that's the emergency preparedness stuff. Now we're going to talk about fun operating, how to be a better operator, or how to be a better operator on HF. So setting up your station. So everyone asks me, how do I set up a station? How do I set up a station? You know, whatever. And, and, well, you got to ask yourself some questions first. Like, where? Where do you want to set up your station? You want to set it up at home? That's easy. You put an antenna up or whatever. And by the way, don't tell me that, oh, I want to put a station up, but the wife won't let me put up an antenna. What? I says, who, who pays the bills around there? I says, the well, wife does. Uh, ah, okay. I said, well, then if that's the case, bribery is your best option. And, and I've known <laughs> I've known people to bribe their, uh, <laughs> their significant others with all sorts of stuff, money and jewelry and whatever. Uh, a friend of mine, every time his wife upgraded, uh, she got <laughs> something in return. <laughs> so... Um, Bribery works. Do that. You know, I mean, uh, put up put up a decent antenna. You can put it in your car, a boat, a recreational vehicle. I mean, that's great. And portable at parks, camps, ham fests. I mean, this is what we do. In fact, it's always fun. If you, if you live in a tenement or something, you can't put an antenna up, do it at a park. You know, we have these, these compressed air launches. We shoot antennas over the trees, whatever. We put an antenna, you know, 50 feet in the trees. Uh, the thing really kicks butt. So before you do that, you got to do your homework. You, you got to find out what's allowed and what is not. So you know, we go in the parks. We have a, a, a standing thing with the Vermont State Parks that we activate them. They know who we are, and for the most part, it's not a problem. There are some restrictions on generators at times, and usually when there is, they just give us a place to plug in. Not a problem. We carry enough cable with us. We can plug in or run the generator. Figure out where everything can fit. Figure out you can actually get an antenna in the air. Do you actually have trees to put the antenna up, or too many trees where you can't get a wire up? You know, um, a lot of that is done using uh, the Google Earth. You know, looking at the satellite photo, looking at where you're going to set up, and making sure you can do that. And and also plan for safety. Make sure that you can do things properly. Uh, so what you're going to need? Well, you're going to need a radio. And you're going to need power. You're going to need um, the power can either come from an AC plug nearby, make sure you have enough cable, or a generator. We use generators. We, we bring amplifiers and generators. We don't fool around. When we do a park activation that's a de-expedition. Or you can run off a battery, or you can run off the battery in your car. But if you do that, have an alternate way to jumpstart your car in case you run the battery down. Um, now, the other thing is make sure you bring the power cable for your radio. If you bring the radio and everything else and leave the power cable home, your activation is all over. And I say this all the time, and just this past Saturday, I was a victim of my own statement. I go to plug in my, uh, my Elecraft K3, which is a, um, a power pole plug, and the cable I brought was not the power pole. It was a six pin thing that fits into the icoms. I go, holy crap, what am I going to do now? 
and I had to think fast and I realized I had a power pole um, in my car that I used to feed stuff and I had to quickly cannibalize that, cut it off and, and twist it on. I didn't have the soldering iron, I just twisted it on and got myself on the air in a few minutes doing that. Um, but yeah, um, what I always tell people is if you're going to go uh, set up in a park or even do field day, build the station in your living room or away from your shack and turn it on and make sure everything works. That's how you know you got everything, right? Um, your location, where are you going to be? If you set up on a picnic table outside, I guarantee you it will either rain or get very windy. It just will happen. And uh, my SP200 amplifier really hates rain. The rain drips through the top of the cover and hits the 2000 volts. Not a good situation. Um, so I, I have a van. I, I have a minivan. I just set up in the back of the minivan. I'm comfortable back there. I don't care about the weather. Or else it can be a shelter in the park or you can set up a, like a, um, a canvas thing or whatever. But if you're setting up a canvas thing, it takes time to set that up too. Uh, make sure you have a computer for logging. Uh, don't log on a piece of paper, for, for the love of God. I mean, really, a um, piece of paper, and then it gets windy, it blows away, then you got to kind of transpose that into a computer. No, don't do that. Uh, use a computer. Make sure the computer has enough battery to run. Make sure it's backed up. And spotting, you're going to use the computer for spotting. But let me tell you something. A lot of the parks up here don't have Internet service. I, I was at a park not that far from where I am here, up by the Canadian border. Yeah, I was hitting a Canadian tower, but that didn't do me any good. I, could, I couldn't spot myself. I had to kind of beg people to spot me. Uh, make sure you bring headphones. Make sure you bring a microphone and a key or a key if you do CW. Uh, if you're going to do FT8, uh, make sure you bring the FT8 cable that goes between the computer and the radio. Uh, a tuner, um, particularly if you're using a non-resident antenna. And a good antenna. Don't use something with a coil in it, mounted on your car, or mounted on a tripod for, for, for crying out loud. You know, why sell yourself short? Put something up in the sky uh, so it, you know, you want to work people instead of just keep keeping yelling your head off until somebody comes back to you. So know your propagation. If if you just live on 20 meters. Uh, and, and not everyone understands this. If you live on 20 meters, you could discriminate against everyone within 600 miles. 20 meters normally has a 600 mile skip zone. What that means is when I drive to Dayton, the guys in Vermont aren't going to hear me on 20 meters until I get past Columbus. Dayton's about 600 miles. That's about where it is. And going in the other way uh, up to Nova Scotia. That, that area is blacked out. Uh, so if you're on 20 meters, you're basically telling everyone in one, two, and three land, pound sand, you ain't going to work me. That's the way it goes. And, and that's not right to do that. So be sure to uh, have ability to use a lower band like 40 meters. Sometimes 40 meters goes long too. Um, you can do 80 meters, but a lot of people don't get on for the park activations on 80. 10 and 15 are coming back, but they go out through the sunspots. I mean, they, they I, I call... Uh, 10 and 15 meters, the boutique ham bands. You, know, they, they, you get these poppy openings out to Texas, but not much else. You, you don't work a lot of people. So, I mean, it's good for like about 20 minutes, but uh, it, you're not working a lot of people. So when you're setting up the station, you don't want to aim for mediocrity. Uh, don't, I, I mean, Trust me on this, 54 years, I've, I've done Mickey Mouse stations, and I've learned that, you know, it's just – with a little bit more time and effort, you can build a station right and work a lot of people and have a lot of fun. If you aim for mediocrity, you just may meet your goal, and that's not too good. So put up the best station you can physically put up. That's really the thing. The better the station works, the more fun you'll have. And the poor antenna and low power will guarantee you'll discriminate against low power stations. So the guy says, yeah, I use my buddy pole and my five watts and I go to a park and I operate for 10 minutes and I work my 10 guys. Well, basically, you work the 10 strongest guys in the country doing that. The, the guys running a little 100 watts in the dipole, they ain't, they ain't going to hear you. So um, when I do a park activation with, with my buddy, we typically will do between six and 800 QSOs in eight hours. 
Okay, yeah, to, to us it's just the contest. We just go and work a lot of people and just have a ball. We're working DX, the whole thing. That's really what it's about. It, it, if we're not working on one, well, at least for me, if I'm not working on one right after the other, it's kind of like, ah, this is a waste of time, whatever. Uh, my friend, he likes to go a little bit slower, so he, he doesn't mind it so much. Understand your signal. And, and this is, uh, we're going to get a little technical here, but it's kind of important. So we're going to take as our baseline 100 watts to a 25 foot high dipole. This is kind of like a base uh, station, you know, a, a, kind of like an average ham station, right? 100 watts to a 25 foot high dipole. Certainly, if you run more power, as, as we can see here, uh, if you're on 500 watts, you're going to pick up an S unit. If you're on 1500 watts, you're going to pick up two S units. Okay, but if, you, if you're doing a park activation, um, you're probably not going to bring a 1500 watt amp with you. But then look at the other way. If, if you're using a 10 watt radio, QRP radio, you're losing two S units. If you use one watt, you're losing three S units. Now, let's go over here and look at the antennas. Here's your dipole at 25 feet. That's, that's zero, right? That's your baseline. If you put that dipole up 50 feet up at the tippy tops of the trees, that antenna may give you 3 dB of gain over a longer path. I mean, if, if it's a short hop thing, you know, between here and New Jersey, whatever, probably not. But out to like uh, the Midwest or out to California, you'll, you'll pick up a few dB. So that's like a half an S unit. And of course, a Yagi, you're not going to drag a Yagi to a park, but a Yagi would be a, an, an S unit and a half. But look at the whip. You have a whip on the back of your car. And this is about an average. You're losing about, about a S unit and a half. So um, if we compare... 10 watts to a whip, what a lot of park activators do, you know, they got a little 10 watt QRP rating, a little whip or a little Mickey Mouse antenna, whatever, compared to 100 watts to a low dipole, if we add up the decibels, it's minus 10 dB plus another minus 9 dB, that's minus 19 dB, that's three S units down from 100 watts to a 25 foot high dipole. What does three S units mean? Well, if the 100 watt station is S8, that means that the 10 watt station is only going to be S5. I got some bad news for you. My average noise level runs about S5, and that's in the park. At home, it's even more. Okay, so um, yeah, it puts you in the noise. Uh, like, oh, I hear you fine. You should be hearing me fine. I say, oh, well, you're hearing me fine because I'm running 500 watts with a dipole way up in the trees. You're running low power. And so, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder. So that, that's important. And the other thing to understand is antenna height is everything. Uh, the height dictates where your signal will go. So what we're looking at now is a side view of an antenna. And this is the vertical radiation. So if the antenna is kind of low, like four, a quarter wavelength high, on 20 meters it would be 17 feet in the air. Okay, so really low dipole on 20 meters. You can see that this thing is radiated pretty much straight up. Right now, that may be great for 40 and 80. That's not so good for 20. 20, you want you don't get short skip on 20 normally. Normally, you, you want to be going out to the Midwest or California, or whatever. You you want to be down here, not up here. So 17 feet, not so good. If you raise that antenna to 34 feet, it gets a lot better. Uh, you get a lobe at 30 degrees, which is probably really good for Indiana and Illinois and places like that, nine land, nine land and four land. That's, that's where you, you'll bang into those guys, you know, one right after the other. And then if you go um, really high, like uh, 52 feet, that's not really high, but, you know, reasonably high, um, you're going to have this lobe. God, I hate Zoom. Stop doing that. Um, you're going to have a lobe down here around 20 degrees. That gets ideal for places like California and maybe uh, Western Europe. So when, when we ask the question, how high should I put up my antenna? The question I'm going to ask you is, did it fall down in the last storm? No, then it ain't high enough. So that leads to Stern's laws of antennas. Um, I put Maxwell's equations here, which is the basic thing for antennas, but Maxwell's equations has a lot of integral calculus and all that, and people don't know what the heck it's saying. So I've simplified it. I call it Stern's laws instead of Maxwell's laws. And so the first one is there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. What that means is the larger of two antennas will always be better. They, they both got to be properly designed. 
He said, well, I got this little whip that's laying on the ground. It ain't going to work that good. Well, I work people on it. Yeah, well, yeah, you can, but the, the bigger antenna will work a lot better. That's what you're giving up. Who cares about SWR? So a guy's, well, SWR, I can get my SWR lower. It doesn't matter. The SWR, it keeps the transmitter happy. You got to do it. If you have high SWR, your transmitter is going to get pissed off and die and you know cost you a lot of money to fix, right? So you, you do have to keep the SWR low, but that's not going to affect your signal, all right? So it has nothing to do with signal strength. Just use a tuner. I call a tuner. Tuner is cocaine for transmitters. Makes the transmitter happy. Does nothing for your signal. Makes the transmitter happy. So I, I use a non-resonant dipole. It's, it's 120 feet long, fed with open wire line and it will go anywhere location always beats any antenna just like real estate location 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 being in the right spot always has more gain than any antenna why do you think everyone goes to the caribbean to operate a it's warm and there's a nice beach and two you're a lot louder everywhere <laughs> that's why probably it has more to do with the latter than the former and height is everything as as we said so know your antennas. I, I always have fun with this. Um, so like the first thing, what's a hustler? By the way, I own a hustle, right? So I, I'm not making fun of it. What's a hustler? Anyone know what a hustler? They usually go around the room, people would raise their hands, right? A hustler is someone knows how to get money from others. <laughs> okay, that's what a hustler is. <laughs> what's a buddy pole? I, I, I was at Dayton and I was making fun of buddy poles and uh, I see these three guys in the front of the room making faces at me and uh, I say anyone here from buddy pole and they raise their hand they go oh crap <laughs> they, they were not happy what's a buddy pole a buddy pole is your best pal in SP land Poland buddy pole ah. okay I, I don't hear any laughter so I guess that joke fizzled what's a ham stick well a ham stick is a stick used to keep hams away from normal people. And a tripod is a mount used to hold up a camera, not an antenna. If you're putting, I, I finally taught my buddy, he says, don't, a tripod is for your camera, not for the antenna. Antenna should be high in the air, not on a tripod. So uh, some pictures of antennas, if I can get this thing to, uh, cooperate with me and I guess it's not going to cooperate this is at Night Point State Park this is where we were uh, Sunday right you can see the dipole going straight up here between two trees this this isn't all that high this is maybe about 35 feet up trees they are not super high whatever but it's high and in the clear fed with open wire line and um, works really well um, this is I, this was the Lowell Urban Park uh, National Park in, in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, the trees are all tiny, all these little shrubs, and so I put myself up a 25 foot mast and hung the dipole from it. Here's my generator in the front of the uh, car there, and said, "Do they allow generators there?" And I go, "Well, uh, I'll be honest, I didn't ask. <laughs> it was pretty noisy there. They didn't hear. It's a quiet little Honda." Uh, this, this is why I was fun with this is the uh, if you don't recognize this is the Federal Hall on Wall Street in Manhattan and that's a picture of George Washington and if you notice that George Washington has this appendage behind him and and, and I, I keen I will recognize that that is not part of the statue here's what it really looks like from behind uh, I had a 17 foot pole tied to his butt <laughs> and a 40 meter dipole hanging off of it by the way this building across the street is the new york stock exchange so someone said did the cops say anything i said we never saw a cop all day he said we a guy came over and said he was a um he was from a block captain or something and he asked me if i had permission to be there and i says yeah i spoke to the manager of the federal building and he said uh, you know have fun don't burn the joint down it's a national monument this is not a problem and this is where we operated so this was a kind of like park around the corner and walk in. We actually did find parking in Lower Manhattan. This was on a on a Saturday, so we had to bring everything in on a little um, a little cart. So no tables and chairs. We sat on the cold cement. It was really cold and miserable that day. But 
uh, here's my little netbook there. I have a, a DX70 and a LIFO battery and the tuner, and I'm sending sending with a hand key. We, we pulled about 220 contacts out of a place where we were surrounded by 40-story buildings. So, so the stuff worked. This is a, a more uh, a, a better operation. This is an Underhill State Park. Uh, so you see, I got the amplifier going here. I got the big tuner. I got the Elecraft. I mean, we, we're ready to bury. I think we did about 800 contacts. And I did set up on a picnic table, which I don't like to do, but it didn't rain that day, fortunately. So basic operating skills. Listen carefully. I mean, received information is critical, particularly if you're operating in a contest. You've got, you got to get the exchange right. Uh, if, if you copy the exchange wrong or write it down wrong, um, you lose the contact. So you want to use a good speaker or headphones. In fact, don't even use a speaker. Just use headphones. Even if you're in a quiet shack, just use headphones. When you're transmitting, talk in short bursts. Don't give a monologue. Say the important information, avoid all else. I have a guy, I go back to him, and he's like, in the noise level, I can make out like every fifth letter or word, and he's giving me a whole story and whatever, a whole Megilla. It's like, uh, we, I call that diarrhea of the mouth. It's like, guy, just the call sign and the state. That's it. I, I, you know what? Anything else, send me an email. I can't hear you. Um, Sometimes I'll tell people, people don't modulate very well. Uh, they don't enunciate. Um, in fact, I, I love, when I do this at Dayton, I love to make fun of them out in the Midwest because, um, you know, like in the Midwest, they, anyone here from the Midwest? Or, right? They kind of like have a speech impediment, you know, they kind of like slur everything, you know. And, and it's like, I can prove it to you. It's, what, what's, that ta what's that city to the south of Dayton? Oh, you mean Cincinnati? No, it's not Cincinnati. It's Cincinnati. It ends with an I, not an A. <laughs> I said, yeah, you guys may call it that, but we don't know that. Um, so sometimes I, I can't hear a guy. They're very, very weak. I says, for crying out loud, stand up on the damn table, scream out, open the window, scream out the top of your lungs, your call sign, and they get mad and they do it, and then I copy them. Fine. So it means they just weren't modulating. Use phonetics on HF. If you're going to give your call sign, give phonetics or don't give it at all. Um, my call sign W1SJ, if I were to not use phonetics, it would come back as W1FJ, W1XJ. It's always Whiskey One Sierra Juliet. That's it. And um, so yeah, don't, don't even give it without the phonetics. And think before you speak, have something to say. If in the contest, it's going to be 5-9 New Hampshire or 5-9 or FN 43 or whatever it is, uh, th that's really all you need to do. Uh, save the pleasantries for later. Take careful notes while listening. So, you know, you have the computer, take it on the computer or write. If, if you write, I don't write. Uh, everything is done on the computer. I keep notes on the computer, too, because I can't read my handwriting. And we operated from a park, and, and my buddy, he, uh, he kept the list of the park to parks on a separate piece of paper. I couldn't read his handwriting either. So for crying out loud, get software where you can put it in the log so I can see it. So you become a better operator by engaging in contesting. And the goal is to work as many stations in as many locations as possible. Speed and accuracy are paramount. That's what you're shooting for. You want to get those contacts you, you want to make the contacts, you want to make them accurately, you want to get them in the log, bang, 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 really quick. Not that easy to do when you first do it, because you've got to multitask. You've got to talk and type and listen all at the same time. It, it's not a skill you're normally born with. You kind of have to develop the school. But it's a great way to briefly meet many, many people. And you say, well, con well you, all you can't just do is you do that hello, goodbye thing. Not really. Uh, we know all. All the contests know each other pretty much, and we'll like spend maybe a minute. Yeah, how you doing? How's the family? Yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah. One minute, one minute tops. You know, we'll, we'll we'll cover a whole year in one minute and then move on. Uh, yeah, the rest of it we'll we'll meet you at Dayton or we'll meet you at Nearfest or whatever. And we'll we'll pick it up from there. Great way to work many new states and countries. I, I work fifty states in a weekend. Uh, I'll, I'll usually get like seventy countries in a weekend easily, and it's really the best way to hone your operating skills. So you got to plan. Plan before the event. Uh, learn the exchange and the rules. 
Don't just say, oh, I don't know what to give you. You, you know, l learn what it is. It's, it's going to be usually a signal report, and it's going to be either a state or a section. Both Vermont and New Hampshire, the section and the state are the same. That's easy enough. But, you know, you got Massachusetts, you got east and west, and you got nine different sections in California and three in Florida, and none of those guys know where the heck they are, and that's always a problem. Um, don't rush your call sign. This is something we have to go after our field day operators. They, they, send the, they say the call sign fast. I says, no, say the call sign deliberately. So our club call sign, W1 November Victor Tango, Northern Vermont, um, pause after the end. W1 November Victor Tango. The Victor Tango emphasizes it, and you put that pause in there, people can hear, latch onto it a lot better. It says, give the exchange. They may not hear you. Don't really get into a whole thing. Do not say QRP if you're operating QRP. The basic reason is, and I'll be all perfectly blunt, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care whether you're QRP or QRO or whether you're married or single or what your pronoun is. I mean, that's great. Again, if it's important for you to let me know that, send me an email. That's great. Oh, I'm only running five watts to a buried wire. Oh, that's great. Fine. Don't don't send it during the thing. And the QRP guys, I always laugh about. I should give a talk at the four days in May thing at Dayton, and the, the, the QRP gathering, and tell them this stuff. But I won't do it unless they put up chicken wire so they can't throw the beer bottles at me. So <laughs> um, the people say QRP, they never give their call sign phonetically. They'll say something like W three TBG QRP. What? W3QRB2, and I says, well, W3QRP, go ahead. No, no, W3TBGQRP. And they keep saying, the, I said, will you lose the QRP and just give me your call sign phonetically? I don't need to know the QRP part. And, and they won't do it. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, why make your call sign longer than it has to be? Um, I say, don't say mobile. I actually do that. I, I say mobile because mobile has a lot of... Uh, um, uh, syllable syllabus into it a, a lot of energy into it uh, and so actually they'll hear that so that's not bad don't say park to park it, it, when you're doing a thing just give your call sign I can't log park to park just give the call sign if I can hear you I guarantee you I will work you if I can't hear you then it doesn't matter whether you say park to park or anything else right just say the call sign but they, they won't they say park to park park to park park what's your call sign park to park no just give me the call sign <laughs> Now, I'll tell you one thing that does work. Um, in the sweepstakes, uh, very hard for us to work Yukon, VY1. And usually the guy operating is VY1JA, J, right? So the problem is we got crappy conditions from New England to Yukon, and we have to go through a wall of guys out west to get to them. And so when I hear him on, I just yell. I don't even give my call sign. I just yell Vermont. Vermont! Vermont! And I jump up and down as I'm doing it, whatever. And Jay goes, wait a minute. Did I hear Vermont? I go, oh, yes, you certainly did. And I worked the guy, and you hear people growling up and down the band, you know, uh, because he needs me as bad as I need him. Now, I guarantee you, if you yell Massachusetts, it ain't going to work. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that, that's why I live here. That's why I pay the high tax and deal with all the nonsense, because I can yell Vermont and get through. So, yeah, give your calls. When, when someone asks for a repeat, if I say W6, don't say the W6 again. Give me the call, the part of the call I'm missing. Because the reason is the, the noise is going up and down and your signal is going up and down. And you want I want to catch a point where your signal comes out of the noise for like a second or two and I get those three letters. If you keep saying the W6, that always comes through and the rest of them don't. So if I just say KA2, don't repeat that. Just say the last three letters over and over again phonetically, and chances are you'll come out of the noise long enough. I'll get you in the lock. That's what it takes. Um, it, that's what I hear. You know, I just you just got to say what I need to hear. So yeah, belt out your call and exchange like you need it. You know, th you think of yourself as an opera singer, and you got to belt out the song. That's how you're going to get through because there's a lot of QRM and noise there. So practice the three key skills, listening, getting it right the first time, sending, learn enunciation and voice control, and logging, accuracy counts, learn not to make errors. For instance, don't type an O when you mean to type a zero. That will, you'll lose the contact if you do that. Okay, timing is everything. When you're operating, 
you go back to people right away because that's how they know you're hearing them. If there's a pregnant pause in there, now they're not sure whether you copy them or not. Ignore anything that doesn't produce results. So I, a guy stole my frequency once in a contest, and I was so mad, I smashed a chair. I, God damn guy, you know, I'm pretty, uh, pretty hot-headed guy, at least back then. And I wrote to the league and said, you know, that guy stole my frequency. I got mad. I smashed a chair. Do I get points for that? And the league writes back, no, Mitch, you don't get any extra points for smashing a chair. Sorry about that. So I don't do that anymore. I get mad, though, but I, I, I leave it. So know your propagation and analyze your efforts after the event. So breaking pileups. Uh, so some of you guys may like to work DX, right? Um, so, so a couple of things. And I listen to this. I hear some just really crazy things people do. They don't know. Assess the pileup before calling. Don't just start dumping your call in there because you, you have to know what's going on. First of all, are they operating simplex or split? That's important because if they're operating split, don't call on the output frequency. A, they're not going to hear you. And B, you're going to tick everyone off and they're all going to yell at you. They're all going to call you a lid and they're all going to double on each other. It's just going to make a big mess of things. And by the way, if you're senior like me, you push the split button and then you you, you forget to push the split button. I know to operate split and I forget to push it and then they yell at me. So, um, yeah, you have to be on top of it. Again, avoid descriptors like QRP and mobile. Uh, don't give a partial call sign. One guy, uh, it was a guy in Italy, and he kept saying, a Charlie whiskey, a Charlie whiskey. A Ch I guess he had Charlie whiskey in his call, whatever. A Charlie, and, and I ignore people give me partials. Uh, you want to work me, you got to give me the whole call sign. If you want a short call sign, then get an extra class license, pay the FCC and get a special call sign, but don't give me, don't make something up. And so after about, about 20 minutes, I go back to the Charlie. I said, no, no, no Charlie Whiskey. I'm only operating sideband today. And the guy went nuts. Charlie Whiskey, Charlie Whiskey. He started jumping up and down, whatever. You know, I mean, I mean, hey, listen, I'm having fun, right? So listen, if you cannot hear the guy, then he can't hear you probably. So don't call. Don't just make a bigger mess of things. Um, again, make sure they're using split. And don't call out a turn or tail end. I had a big problem in the... Um, New England QSO party, I went to 40 meters. I couldn't copy anyone because I'd go back to people. I'd go back to Charlie Alpha. I said Charlie Alpha on CW because the guy had Charlie Alpha on his call. And four guys come back to me and have none of those letters in their call sign. And, you know, I go Charlie Alpha again. And then finally I just say AAA, you know, I say stop, Charlie Alpha KN. And again they do it. And I, I just said, the heck with this. I went back to phone. Um, really don't do that. I mean, first of all, if you're not copying me, don't just call blindly. Don't call out a turn and don't tail in at the end. That's rude. I, I tell our W1AW operators, if people misbehave, turn the radio off. They need you. You're the master of ceremonies. If you go away, the party is over. Avoid comments and criticisms. I like got in the middle of pile up. Oh, this is stupid. Well, it may very well be stupid, but we don't need you, Captain Obvious, telling us that. Or people making snide remarks on the reflector. People read the reflector. And someone, uh, I was operating, and uh, they, they spotted me and said, hey, stupid, work split. And I saw that, and I wasn't entirely pleased, but I noted the guy's call sign, and I allowed him to call me for the next three hours and not go back to him. I blacklisted him. And finally, right at the end, I, I finally worked them. I said, the reason why I didn't go back to you is um, your nastiness on the reflector will not be tolerated. That is not okay. And then he blamed his friend. My friend did it. I said, well, if your friend did it, he shouldn't be a friend. I mean, that, that's just, that, that's inappropriate. So in a pilot, pick your battles wisely. Uh, the start is going to be the roughest time. That's when you're going up against the kilowatts and the big Aggies, right? If you're low power, wait towards the end. Uh, pick the bands and the times with the best propagation. That's that's important. Um, that's really it is. Have, have the right attitude. If you don't exceed, try again. That, that, you have to just keep trying. Eventually, you're gonna, you know, like winning the lottery. You may get lucky, maybe you're not. Um, if, if you get really upset, you get mad or whatever, walk away. Go for a walk. I, I mean, if, if, if something's happening on ham radio that's ticking you off, don't engage in it. Walk away. Fortunately for someone like me, I have a really short memory. I, I, I forget who I am some days. I walk away 
five, ten minutes later, I said, what am I doing walking around? How come I'm not in the house trying to work this guy? And I go back, I completely forgot about it. Training new operators, this is really important, right? I, I mean, uh, this is an emphasis, thing that we're really emphasizing here. Um, you know, the league has just changed the GOTA rules so that the GOTA station is five points per contact, which is insane. Our, our GOTA station does over 500 QSOs. Our GOTA station would have outscored our CW station last year. Um, so we, we, we're pretty serious about our GOTA station. Now we're going to be doubly serious. So you train new operators, you use an existing activity like field day or the light contest, like the QSO party. So when we do the Vermont QSO party, I bring people in here. I said, this is going to be easy. I said, it's our QSO party. We're God. They're going to come to us. They're going to be no QRM. It's going to be great. And they, they love it. They go in there. They work people. Uh, special events uh, like the W1AW thing, park activations. I put people on. They said, well, can I watch? I said, no, there's no watching. This isn't a spectator sport. This is you get on and operate, and I will give you prompts. I'll help you along. And eventually, when I see that you're, when you're treading water and, and keeping your head above the water, I'm going to go in the other room, lay down, and take a nap. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. And the guy said, I did terrible. I didn't do anything. I said, how did those 50 QSOs get in the log in the last 30 minutes? Did that happen by accident? I said, no. Uh, the other thing, operators do their own logging. It is way harder to have a separate operator and a separate logger. You've, you've got to be in absolute sync with each other. You do your own logging. In other words, you have to learn how to type and talk at the same time. Yeah, it's hard, but you'll learn how to do it. We, we tell our GOTA operators, call CQ. Most effective way to do it. Don't tune around. What we see with, with people, tuning, they, they sit there and they're tuning up the band and tuning down the band and not working anyone. No, no tuning around. Get on a freak, find a frequency, it's clear, call CQ. Well, what happens if somebody comes back to me? Well, you work them. <laughs> what if I didn't get the call? You say, you say, say again. What if I didn't get it the second time? You keep saying, say again until you either get it or they get frustrated and leave. You know, the uh, if the guy who's helping you, he may give you a hint or two to help you. CQing also sets up a predictable routine, which is good. So uh, as, as the people helping, we have cue cards um, to, to let people know what to do. You, get, you have to give a lot of positive feedback. Yeah, you're doing great. You're doing great, you know. But you want to push the operator to, to make the contacts, to get in there, to sweat a little bit. Um, don't push too hard, though. Um, I, we had, I had one guy that was going to have a car and everybody. He was like kind of shaking and whatever. Uh, so you, you kind of have to read the person. But, you know, help out. After they, they're really struggling, you help out. You say, well, it's this call sign, not that. So you want to emphasize three key things. Uh, listening, speaking, and logging. And timing is the other one. So you want to listen. So, you know, I mean, basically you call CQ, 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 CQ contest. W1 November Victor Tango. Some guy's going to come back to you. And when that guy comes back to you, you immediately go back to him. You either go back with a report, your 5-9 Vermont, or you go back, didn't copy, try again. But don't leave that pause. That pause, it was basically leave space for somebody else to jump right in there and take your frequency away. And then as you're doing this, you got to log them. you got to type them in the computer correctly, which means you got to be a good typist. We have a couple of two-finger guys here. They, they're pecking around and they make all sorts. I mean, I actually do that. My mistakes are not from hearing the call wrong. It's I hear the call right. I, I fat finger it sometimes. So correct the bad habits, not giving the call sign. So you got to give the call sign at the end of every contact. Important so they know who you are. Making sure you give phonetics. Not clearly indicating a copied QSO. So the way you do that is you say, thank you. That's a thank you is, is the, when someone says thank you, that means I got it. You're in the log. Go away. <laughs> well, not go away, but you know, that's it. You're done. Some guys come back to me. Ah, did you get it? Did you get it? Yeah, I said, thank you. You got it. On CW, it's, it's T-U. Da, 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 da. Yeah, da, 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 da. D-U or did it. That, that means you got it. Uh, not projecting your voice. People start getting cotton mouth. Woo, 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 woo. No, no, don't do that. Um, when you're operating for long periods of time, you may get fatigued and start doing that stuff. So uh, you have to learn how, as a long haul contester, you have to learn how to regenerate yourself 
or if it's like field day, you switch operators. So again, push the operator to be self-sufficient. Uh, don't push too hard. Monitor the operator looking for consistency and, and then eventually walk away. If they're doing fine, walk away. At field day, we also have a rule, no standing around the newbies and watching them. They're self-conscious. Okay, so I mean, people come in the phone tent, they watch me, I don't care, they sit there and they talk, they make all sorts of noise, I'm in the zone, man, I don't care, but the uh, the new operators don't like that, so I tell them, I says, you can't stand around and watch them, you got to go to the other side of the tent, and we usually like to limit the operator time to under two hours, you know, keep it interesting, but, but keep them fresh. So be active, and you guys are, because your meeting sounds just like our meeting. You're planning the same thing that we're planning, right? Field day, activations, and all that. Uh, you're moving equipment to the field. You're setting stuff up, right? Uh, all sorts of things can go wrong. You're deploying an antenna. You're operating under emergency power. You're making lots of contacts. Problems like QRM and noise and equipment failure you got to deal with. You have other members available now. You, know, so you have a group of people, so if you have a problem, you got some people, well, let's try this, let's try that. And you're also dealing with the public. Someone comes over, can I ask what the heck you're doing with these wires and the trees and all that? And, and actually, I'm not the one to describe it. I'm the operator. I get other people to do that. You, see, you, you guys talk about it. I'm, I, I operate from Mount Equinox in the VHF contest. It's just me. And people come over, and of course, they always start with, uh, can you talk to Mars on that thing? And I say, well, if some ham was up there, yes, I can, but they're not there. So I put a little piece of paper in the window of my car. What is all this stuff, and what does it mean? But I don't like doing that, because when I put a piece of paper on the outside of my car, that almost guarantees it's going to rain. Um, so, in other words, this is perfect operator training. It's perfect publicity for ham radio. So the key skills for common to best operators, listening, speaking or keying, logging, the setup and knowledge of the equipment, evaluation and improvements. Always good. What did, what did we do? Did it work? Didn't it work? What, what was screwed up? And let's make sure that doesn't get screwed up again. We, we brought a, my, I have an IC718, the field day. Great little toy radio, horrible for field day, dirty as hell. It was like wiping out every other station we had to take it off the air so you know that, that's something we learned the hard way safety really really important we're, we're putting up 50 foot towers uh th th we we have some pretty strict safety rules about all that and you just keep practicing you get good at it so um i will now take questions Hey, very good. Uh, let me change my view so I can see people. Does anybody online on Zoom have a question for uh, for Mitch? You may be muted, so if you do, unmute yourself first. Uh, otherwise, is there anybody physically here that has any questions for Mitch? Well, I have a question here for Mitch. Well, e either I did really well and they know everything, or they're all asleep and you're waking them up. No, I, I'm going to wait for this one, Mitch. Sorry. Um, question. So when you're doing uh, your basically your portable events, are you doing actual parks on the air activations or are you just doing just general like, you know, portable type setups? No, we, we're doing park activation. So the, the New England QSO party, what, what I did for that is we actually activated two parks on, on Saturday. So, you know, it's that two day thing. Uh, so we, we always did one park and we said, well, let's do two parks, you know, two is better than one. And so I, I actually uh, put in, in the category is mobile. So we go to a, a park in Franklin County, Vermont, and on Saturday, which the Saturday operating time for that's four in the afternoon to one in the morning. So basically you operate up to your drop. And then at one in the morning, I roll out the sleeping bag in the, in the back of the van, go to sleep, and wake up in the morning, take it all down, drive over to Grand Isle County. Grand Isle County is very rare. There's only like 10 hams there. Um, so, uh, and we're the only station that you could work in Grand Isle County for the CUSO party. So, uh, and both, you know, we were in 3126 on Saturday and 3125 on Sunday. So it was a dual, du two different things. Um, in two weeks, we're going to activate Camel's Hump State Park. Uh, that's just going to be a park activation. Uh, that's a tough park because uh, the parking lot is about as big as this room. Uh, and so you have to get there like 
really, really early to get a parking spot. Otherwise, we're stuck on the road somewhere, and you know, we've got to figure out where to put our antennas. So uh, we, we try to do um, a park a month, except for field day, you know, except June, where we're going to be uh, doing field day. And so when you just do a park, you're pretty much like there for like an eight hour, eight to 10 hour period. You're not doing like a, you know, either a rove or, you know, some like a short activation on your own. It's, it's, it's a pretty big setup, correct? Yeah. I mean, essentially we'll get there like around nine. Uh, we'll hopefully get on the air by about 10, 1030. And um, usually Bob, he's an old guy. He leaves. <laughs> He leaves at four. I, I hang out there usually five or it depends. If I'm working a lot of people, I may hang out there a little bit longer than I get home late for dinner and get yelled at by the wife, but hey, I'm having a good time. But yeah, it, it's all day. One of the beauties of doing it all day is propagation changes throughout the day. And so people say, well, I, I couldn't work you in the morning, but then later in the afternoon, I heard you on 40, I was able to work you. And, and it, I tell people, this is, you know, watch the spots and, and, and keep listening. Eventually you're going to hear us pop through. I mean, it, you're going to hear us because, like I said, it's 500 watts to a dipole 50 feet in the air. Um, on 40 meters, that's about as good as it gets, right? Uh, so, that, you know, do that. And um, most people who really want to work us and try hard, they, they do. Great. Thank you. Anybody else have any, uh, any questions uh, for Mitch? I do have another question over here, so bear with me while I traverse the room. I'm going to guess you're a out there. Hi, Mitch. This is uh, Barry NF10. Hi. Uh, I'm a contester. My wife's a contester, and uh, we've worked you many times. Uh, one one thing you did not uh, mention much that that is kind of a pet peeve on on from me is uh, spotting spotting networks. Uh, I use spotting networks a lot. Um, we're DX chasers mostly and do a lot of contesting as well. <clears throat> but uh, one of the pet peeves I have is people spotting things they don't hear. And I see it a lot. I see somebody spotted, you know, d rare DX spotted. And the comment with it is, but I can't hear them. <laughs> it's, why do you spot somebody you can't hear? Spotting is for something that you do hear. Or preferably have work and uh, <clears throat> I wish people would stop that but uh. there, there are a lot of things that hams do that uh, we, we all find annoying uh, or the one I like is they spot you wrong <laughs> they put the wrong call sign down or they spot me as lower sideband it's like well that's like useless if you're on 40 meter phone you're gonna be on lower sideband spot Vermont spot the park you know that, that's that's really important stuff uh, I'm at least happy that they're at least spotting something. That means I don't have to do it as much. Um, in a contest, it's problematic because some people have their cadres of fans and they get spotted incessantly. And that's kind of like unfair, really. Um, in, in the Vermont Cuso party, we tell people you can self-spot because we want people to work you. Just don't get to the point where you're annoying, where you're spotting yourself every five minutes. You know, don't do not do that. You know, you usually spot yourself every time you change modes or bands or whatever, so people can find you. And, and the rule, different contests have different rules. Uh, the VHF contest, you can self-spot. The other ARL contest, you can't. I mean, it, it, it's a whole bunch of different things. But, you know, if you're a CW operator, of course, you've got the skimmers. You don't have to spot anything. They, they do it automatically. Uh, and, of course, CW operators know this. And if they're operating assisted, they're using that pretty incessantly. Yep. Thank you. Does anybody else have any, uh, any questions from Mitch? Not seeing anything here, Mitch, uh, and I don't think I see anything uh, online. So uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for your for your presentation, uh, uh, Mitch. We uh, we appreciate it. I'm sure we all uh, got something we could uh, take away from it. And uh, in a well, nice hope, uh, hopefully, you guys will will do good and feel that. So you guys are what W one GSA? What? Oh uh, no! Normally, when we uh, when we do field day, we operate under uh, N one. Well, uh, November one Quebec Charlie, since we'd be on HF. Okay. Uh, N one QC. Yeah. Okay. That's our, our club call. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Well, hopefully, um, 
get people to think about uh, about doing fielding, getting good at it. Um, it's something we take ser pretty seriously. In fact, we just mentioned in our meeting uh, last night, you know, how, how we're going to deal with some of the rule changes and whatever. And um, our big problem is finding finding the new operators that do the go to station. Uh, we do a picnic every year, and we set up a station at the picnic, and we try and get people to operate. And, and people make this face, you know, and I'm leading them to the thing, to the radio, and it says, they have this look like I'm walking them to the gas chamber. I says, this is supposed <laughs> to be fun. You're supposed to be enjoying this. This isn't terrible. <laughs> you know, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And, uh, and I, I know when I got my, my past my license, it wasn't like instant thing. You had to wait for four to six weeks for the license to come in the mail, right? This is back in the 60s. And I mean, I had the radio ready to go, tuned up, ready to do that first CQ. And I checked the mailbox every day and whatever. And my God, when that license came, I CQ'd for 24 hours straight. But yeah, you know, people think, oh, I don't know if I want to get on the air. What if people hear me? I said, well, that's the whole point of this. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's a little bit different these days, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Well, again, th thank you very much, Mitch.